Hi, my name is Will Dobson, um, but I prefer to be considered Sergei Popovich's spiritual leader. <laughs> it's about the nicest thing anyone has ever said about me. Um, I'm a journalist, uh, as Alex indicated, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what I learned over the course of several years writing uh, my book, which is called The Dictator's Learning Curve. Uh, I want to start with what I think is a fairly un maybe inconvertible truth, which is that it isn't easy being a dictator these days. I think you can just ask any of these gentlemen, and in fact, they would tell you that that's true. Um, not long ago, autocrats could use the most blunt weapons to keep their populations under their thumb. We think of um, Stalin's gulags. Um, we think of Mao's revolutionary campaigns, Pol Pot's killing fields. Today, though, dictators have more forces arrayed against them than ever before. If we were to sort of think about a number of those different factors, um, one of the first that would come to mind is the collapse of the Soviet Union. With its collapse, many lost their chief economic lifeline. In the wake of the Soviet Union's collapse, we saw an enormous boom in the democracy and promotion uh, business. It became a cottage industry overnight. There are now human rights activists, lawyers, journalists who will travel the globe and shine a light on these regimes' worst deeds. Um, we would obviously point to changes in technology. Uh, about nine months before Mubarak's regime collapsed, I, for my book, was spending time with a number of his advisors. And they were quite open about the fact that smartphones and satellite news had made their work much more difficult. So much more difficult, even more difficult than they realized, given that they were on the edge of a pre precipice and had no idea. Um, we would, you know, we could recall 25 years ago, uh, in Tiananmen Square. After the Chinese Communist Party declared martial law, their next act was to end the transmission, pull the plug, in essence, on CNN. Today, if students assembled, if workers assembled in Tiananmen Square, that would be a meaningless act. Um, we know that the events would be captured by thousands of cell phones, iPhones, and transmitted around the world in real time. And maybe the most um, obvious uh, measure of how difficult it is to be a modern authoritarian today is just the empirical numbers themselves, which is that, you know, in 1972 there were 41 democracies in the world. Um, by 1991 that number had risen to 76. By 2005, more than 120. But then something changed. The world's most unsavory regimes made a comeback. Since 2005, we've seen nine consecutive years of a drop in political freedom around the world. It's the longest continuous drop in the last 40 years. We are now have fewer democracies than we've had in nearly 25 years. Uh, and many of our prime examples of success stories, we think of Ukraine, Thailand, now even Hungary, have begun to unravel. So what changed? I believe that the problem doesn't rest with democracy. Even with democracy as battered a brand as it is, as battered a system as it is, if 2011 and 2012 taught us anything, is that people are willing still to take enormous risks in order to be free. What changed is the nature of dictatorship. Today's dictators are far more sophisticated, savvy, and nimble than we often give them credit for being. Faced with those growing pressures that I just itemized, the smartest of them did not fall back and create a police state, nor did they cut themselves off from the world. Rather, what they did was they learned and they adapted. They have honed new strategies and methods and formulas for preserving power. We've that in dictatorship for the modern age. So what do I mean by these methods? Well, in essence, it comes it's born from one central insight, which is that in a globalized world, the best way to exert force or coercion is subtly. So that if Putin would like to close a dissident group in Russia, it is most likely that he will do so with the help of a tax inspector or a health inspector. 
more NGOs have been closed in Russia for health code violations than anything else. In Venezuela, laws are written broadly and then used like a scalpel against those that the government deems a threat. The laws are, are expansive, but applied selectively. So that as one activist there put it to me, he said, you know, the motto of this regime should really be, for my friends, everything. For my enemies, the law. These are governments that are completely fluent in the language of democracy, democracy promotion, and human rights. Having seen the explosion of civil society around the world, they react creatively, intelligently, by creating their own civil society. An artificial appendage to the state. Maybe some of you are even familiar with the term gongos. What is a gongo? A government-operated, non-governmental organization. What does it do? It soaks up the funding that comes in from foreign groups intended to help legitimate NGOs. It makes itself readily available for interviews to journalists like myself. But it gives a, a much more savvy, sophisticated line about the regime's work. And it admits, yes, we have many problems in, your country, in our country. You're right to point them out. Of course, I recall your own country's history. And it was also a problematic one, was it not? Yes. And so you'll get, rather than being met with denials, you get a much more sophisticated narrative from groups that would appear to be independent but are anything but. And then maybe if there's the most like, essential element, is that every modern authoritarian has an election. Now you could say, well, that's nothing new, really. I mean, the Soviet Union had elections. Yes, it did. And Brezhnev would win with 99% of the vote. Today's modern authoritarian understands this. The only election worth stealing is one that appears to be contested. It is far better to win with 70% of the vote. A modern authoritarian will win with 70%, not 99% of the vote. 70% is the new 99. So we imagine, we often imagine, that these regimes are, are dinosaurs, slow lumbering behemoths. And it is true that there are a number of old school dictatorships that have managed to limp into the 21st century. They are the North Koreas and the Turkmenistans of the world. Uh, they do not really make much effort to present themselves as anything other than what they are. But they represent dictatorships past. They are outliers because no one, no aspiring Nigerian colonel who sees an opportunity to remake Nigeria along the lines of a modern authoritarian state says, yes, I want to be the next North Korea. That's not anyone's model. But if it's true that dictators have grown more sophisticated and nimble, it is also true that those that challenge them have as well. And this is a piece of the puzzle that I think that we often miss. When we see people, tens of thousands of people, take to the streets, like we saw in Egypt in 2011, we often assume that it's a spontaneous act. As if, and it's kind of an incredible thing to think, it is the way it's presented to you by the media in most instances, that all of a sudden 10,000 people have the same idea. I mean, Mubarak had been there for 30 years, but on that day, on January 25th, that was the day that people said, actually now, enough is enough. No, that's not how it works. There is, and as my good friend Sergei Popovich taught me in 2009, there is no such thing as a spontaneous revolution. The only thing Sergei told me spontaneity will do is get you killed. It will do that. It's very good at doing that. Rather, what is required is often very tedious work, but necessary work. It's some of the work that Sergei was talking about earlier. And we are not paying attention when movements in countries are learning how to mobilize themselves. Then when they're learning how to chip away at a regime's legitimacy. When they're mastering the tools of propaganda. We look at that, and by we, I don't mean just us here in this room, I mean even the US government, I mean the media, uh, think tanks in Washington, D.C. We, we don't see change until we see this. Then it means something is afoot in that country. When in fact, there are people doing incredibly important work that's just simply being unnoticed until we see these headlines. 
And so it's for that reason that in 2009, that's when I began, I set out to witness this struggle firsthand. Uh, and I traveled to China, Egypt, Russia, Venezuela, and Malaysia. And I spent time with both sides. I spent time with the people who perpetuated the regime, who worked for the regime, and I spent time with the people who were trying to overthrow it. So that meant on the one hand spending time with political advisors, with technocrats, cronies, the military, and on the other side of the ledger spending time with students and academics and lawyers and environmentalists and human rights activists and bloggers. And I, I'm happy to say that I came away from that experience over several years far more optimistic than I began. And the reason was that the people that I found who were challenging with the regimes were not the people I expected to find. There wasn't a romantic in the bunch. And maybe that's because romantics don't last very long in this fight. That could be. But what the people I met were people who were creative, intelligent, savvy, battle-tested strategists from all walks of life. And their work has now led to another moment. And I believe it's a new moment that is truly only now emerging. And that is that having faced the work of democratic movements and opposition activists, we are now witnessing regimes <coughs> engage in, this, in what is really a difficult enterprise. We're beginning to witness the cracks in their facade. And what I mean by that is that we have, an only, in a very short period of time, watched an enormous uptick in political violence from the regimes themselves directed at the people challenging the regimes. I believe that's in part because when the challenge rises and is sufficient enough, we are seeing these governments react, whether out of crisis, paranoia, or both, they are turning inward and then they are lashing out. These are six individuals, all of whom are leaders, democratic leaders in their countries, all of whom are people I spend time with uh, for my book. I'll just mention them briefly. Leopoldo Lopez, in the top, in the top left hand corner, is a, a Venezuelan democracy uh, uh, advocate and leader of one of the leading opposition groups. He has been in a military prison now for 13 months. The man next to him, Antonio Ledesma, was the mayor of Caracas. Last month, he was essentially kidnapped by the Venezuelan state. He is now held in the same prison as Leopoldo Lopez, a military prison that I visited. When I visited it in 2010, I believe, there was really only one political prisoner there. Their numbers have grown, and now they are housed in very close proximity to each other under the same roof. Ahmed Mer. Ahmed Mer was one of the young leaders of the April 6th movement in Egypt. Um, that ultimately brought down the bar. He was arrested and sentenced to three years in prison for a nonviolent protest by the Egyptian military regime. Anwar Ibrahim, the leader of the democratic movement and an opposition leader in Malaysia, who just last month was sentenced to five years in prison on trumped up charges, charges he faced before. He's a target for the Malaysian government because he's the one person who is believed capable of uniting the different forces opposed to the government under one umbrella. Of course, if there is another person in Malaysia who could do that, it would be this woman in the middle, Nurul Isa, Anri Ibrahim's daughter. She was arrested only days ago on charges of sedition for speaking out against her father's arrest. She's been released. The intent was clear, though. It was a warning shot from the government that she should not criticize what they've done to her father and to stand down, which she will not do. And then finally, Hu Jiaqiang. He is one of the bravest human rights lawyers in China, and one of the, actually probably one of the bravest people I've ever met in my life. When I met him, it was right at, it was nine days after Mubarak had fallen, fallen, and most of China's human rights lawyers were under house arrest. Hu Jiaqiang was in Shanghai, he lived in Beijing. So when I contacted him, he said, I'm gonna come from the airport and I'm gonna meet you directly, because if I go home, I may never leave. And so he met me under those conditions, and he's now, he's been in prison since last May, and facing charges for a much longer sentence, for nothing more than 
actually telling the truth about the Chinese Communist Party on their version of, on the Chinese version of Twitter. And then maybe lastly, there's this man, Boris Nemtsov. Boris Nemtsov was murdered last month in Moscow, um, right outside the Kremlin. Boris Nemtsov, when I met, of all the people I met in Moscow, of all the activists and, and opposition leaders I met in Moscow, no one had a keener understanding of Putinism and could explain it better than Boris. And now, he's been silenced. These are not the acts of courageous or confident governments. These are acts of fear for governments that are being tested, for dictatorships that are being tested in the way they've never been tested before. And it's the work of, of people, like I just mentioned, who are truly in this struggle, in this genuine struggle, testing the bounds of democracy and dictatorship. And it's, it's, it's because of people like this, it's because of these people that I met over the course of reporting my book, that I believe that if it is hard to be a dictator these days, it is only getting harder. Thank you very much.